Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is the man that's been stuck in the upside down. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen. It's very good to be seen after all the binging I did this weekend on Netflix, and it's good to see you. Well, it's good to see you, Captain, because today, my friend, we are drinking Lonesome Boatman Ale by the brilliant guys and girls over Outer Light Brewing Company in Connecticut, garage grade four out of five bottle caps. Lonesome Boatman Ale is a red ale. It's very complex red ale, bready, toasty, and hoppy, perfect for these colder months. And Lonesome Boatman Ale was brought to us by, first up, we have Christopher in West Fork, Arkansas. And a big shout out to Lauren in Syracuse, New York. And a big thank you to Celeste in Island Lake, Illinois. And a big we like your jib to Mike in Chesterfield, Michigan. And to the beautiful people in Parts Unknown, we want to thank Daniel, Angela, and Sharon. Yeah, but if they don't have their Parts Unknown t-shirts, they're kicked out, okay? I'm locking the doors. If you don't have a shirt and your ID badge, and some at least some shoes on, no open-toed sandals, spreading fungus. You're kicked out of parts unknown. All right, get your shoes on. And last but not least, all the way from the Gold Coast, we have Paul in Pacific Pines, Queensland, Australia. So cheers, mates, and thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to buy the captain around or you want to buy the Nick around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Or maybe you want to buy the colonel around. Who's that? Anyway, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. We have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. The people are in a car outside the bank. She is getting $15,000 to bring out to them that if the police are told they will kill the children and the husband. They have their faces covered. She is petrified. They told her they wouldn't hurt anybody if she got back there with the money. She believes them. I think she's walking out now. Jennifer Hawk was born in September of 1958. Now, in 1985, she met William Pettit, who was a third-year medical student at the University of Pittsburgh. He went by Bill. We'll call him Bill. So Bill was tall. He was a tall guy, six foot four. He played basketball in high school and his freshman year in college before deciding to focus on his studies. So the two met. Jennifer, a new nurse, and Bill was on pediatric rotation at Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. Their first date, uh, this was a very casual one uh, with dinner and drinks. Uh, Bill brought his parents along for the date. Well, that's that's a move you don't normally see. (laughs) Yeah, not not a common thing here. Meet my parents. I guess this was not a planned move. Mm. Um, You know, this wasn't Bill like trying to take this this first date this early relationship immediately to the next level i guess bill was from you know even when he was a child but more so as an adult he was very close with his mother and father mm-hmm. maybe and, too close some said well to the point where they were like they were good friends right uh they would hang out together mm-hmm. so bill is getting ready to go out on this date getting ready to go pick up jennifer and go to dinner when his father called and just said casually you know Hey, what are you doing this evening? And Bill, Bill's like, well, I'm getting ready to go out uh, to dinner and have some drinks. You want to join me? 
And so it turns out that the four of them have dinner and drinks together. Bill would later later say that this worked out very well for him uh, yeah. because his parents' presence did not make Jennifer nervous at all. Um, so everybody, she had a great time. Everybody had a great time. And Bill's father insisted that he pay the check at the end of the night. So Bill jokingly says that that made Jennifer a cheap date. They, they pretty quickly fell in love, Jennifer and Bill, and would eventually marry. Jennifer and Bill, they purchased a home in 1987. This was a corner lot on Sorghum Mill Drive in Cheshire, Connecticut. This is a quiet street in a quiet neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, the type of street that not many traveled down. Unless you lived there, or unless you were visiting somebody that lived there, you would not drive down Sorghum Mill Drive. Now, this is a pretty ritzy area. Yes, this would be uh, an upper class uh, town, an upper class neighborhood. Their daughter Haley was born just about two years later in 1989. Their second daughter Michaela was born in 1995. Now, sometime during this time period, Jennifer Pettit was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Haley, the older of the two daughters, she was an active fundraiser for MS. And Michaela, she loved to cook. Uh, it was no secret that she loved to cook. The grandparents, she cooked with and for the grandparents. She cooked with and for her parents. Mm -hmm. Now, basketball remained in Bill's life and became a part of his family's life. Uh, Bill held two season tickets to both the women's and men's University of Connecticut basketball teams, and he often took his daughters to the games. Now, in 2007... Haley, the oldest daughter, she graduated from Miss Porter's school, and she was scheduled to attend Dartmouth College. Michaela attended Chase Collegiate School. Right, so that's just a little bit of the background of this family, beautiful family, smart individuals, uh, upper-class neighborhood, uh, doctor, nurse, smart kids, mm -hmm. and that kind of brings us up to uh, 2007. Yeah, Haley was getting ready to go off to attend Dartmouth. I would be lucky to be allowed to sweep the floors at Dartmouth College. They actually declined. <laughs> they turned me down yeah. for that. Um, now, our story takes place in the summer of 2007, um, starting with Sunday, July 22nd. Uh, the Pettit family attended Cheshire United Methodist Church on this Sunday. Like many others, uh, they went to the 9.30 a.m. church service. Um, this, it was just the three, just three of the four family members though, Bill, Jennifer, and 11 year old Michaela. Now, 17 year old Haley, as we had said, who had just graduated high school, she had stayed the weekend with some friends. You know, everyone her age was spending much time together that summer before they all went off to college. Right. Pretty typical. After church, the three members of the Pettit family went home and and Haley returned home from the weekend with her friends. It was a beautiful summer day. Uh, Bill and his father went to the country club to play a round of golf. Jennifer and the two girls piled into her van and drove off for an afternoon at the beach. That evening, Jennifer called Bill to tell him that on the way home from the beach, they had went to the Stop and Shop grocery store. This is a local grocery store and picked up some groceries. Michaela, as she did many nights, wanted to cook the family dinner uh, with her mother's help. So Jennifer was asking Bill to stop at a local farmer's market on his way home to pick up some fresh veggies to go with the meal. Bill got home, and that night the Pettit family had dinner together in the sunroom of their home on that quiet street in Cheshire. After dinner, Bill read the newspaper laying on a couch in the sunroom. The girls sat in the family room watching TV. And at 11 p.m., the girls turned off the TV. They went upstairs to bed, locking the doors and turning off the downstairs lights. Bill had fallen asleep on the couch in the sunroom um, with the newspaper on his chest. Michaela went and she got into bed with her mother and the two read a book together. Now, this brings us to Monday, July 23rd. It's sometime between 2 and 3 a.m. Bill is not really sure what is going on. He's not even sure if he is awake. He can't see anything. 
but he's being hit in the head with a baseball bat. He's in a lot of pain. While he's on the couch. Mm -hmm. When he can finally pull it together, he can see the black silhouette of two men standing in front of him. One with an arm reaching out to Bill, and in his hand is a gun. Its barrel is pointed at Bill, and the gun is right in front of Bill's face. The men tell Bill to get up, and they tie his hands together, first with zip ties and then with rope. They put some kind of cloth over Bill's head, and then they force him to the floor. So again, he cannot see. Then they tie his ankles, again, first with these zip ties and then with rope. They tell Bill that they are, they're just here for the money. Right. We're just here for the money, and then we will leave. They ask Bill. But we just smashed your face and with yeah. a baseball bat. Yeah, they ask Bill where uh, the safe is. Bill tells them that they they do not have a safe. Uh, mm-hmm. He can he can hear one of the men walking out of the room, and he hears that man tell the other, "If he moves, put two bullets in him." One of the men goes upstairs where he finds Michaela still in her mother's bed. Uh, he wakes them and he tells them the same thing he told Bill that, "Hey, we are just here for the money." He pulls Michaela out of the room and he puts her into her room. The men then cover the mother and the daughter's faces uh, by putting pillowcases over their heads. Each is tied to their own bed, the feet and wrist bound to the bedpost. After this, Bill can hear the men searching through his home. At some point, the men are once again standing over top of Bill. Bill by this point is really unsure of what time this could be. Uh, Bill has been beaten Mm -hmm. very badly, uh, so badly that it's hard for him to say if he has lost consciousness at any point. Anyway, they cut the zip ties that are around Bill's ankles. Well, he, he has, you know, three to four inch gaps in his skull and he's bleeding pretty badly. Yeah. He's been, he's been hit in the, the front and the back of his head um, and it's, it's kind of even hard to say how many times he's been struck in the head with this baseball bat. Yeah. Cause his whole, you know, forehead is basically split open. Uh, and so, I mean, he could have been going in and out of consciousness the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they cut the zip ties that are around Bill's ankles. Uh, they pull him up to his feet and then they usher him to the kitchen and then down the basement steps. So the, the basement steps are directly off of the kitchen here. His hands are still tied together at this point, and his face is still covered. Mm-hmm. The, Pettit's, the Pettit family, their basement is unfinished. Um, so it's kind of easy for us to picture this basement, right? You have a concrete floor, cold concrete walls, those steel support posts in the center portions of the basement. Mm-hmm. The men then remove the zip ties from Bill's wrist. They sit him down. Uh, His back is up against one of those support posts in the basement. Then they put his arms behind him and around the post and zip tie his wrist together once again. They zip tie his ankles together and tie rope around both his wrist and ankles. And then they leave him. Um, you know, but before they leave him, they cover his face with like an old quilt that they found lying around in the basement. Yeah. Um, so once again, Bill can hear the men, uh, but he cannot see them. So at this point he can hear them rummaging through the home, uh, apparently looking for valuables. Uh, they are opening up closet doors. They're pulling out drawers, uh, but they are finding very little. Bill is trying to figure this whole thing out. He, he gets the idea that he should start moving up and down on the pole. He wants to create friction against the rope and the zip ties that are on his wrist. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's what he can figure out, right? Bill has no firearms uh, in the home, and he didn't have zip ties or rope in his home. So those items he could figure out that the men had brought with them. The bat that the men used to beat Bill in the head, he believed probably had belonged to him, that they had found it someplace before they had attacked him. Right. At some point, he can hear birds singing and chirping outside. 
Bill knew that this meant that at that point it would have been about 4.45 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. He then hears something in the basement click on. This is the irrigation kicking on. So he knows that the irrigation at his home comes on at 5.30 a.m. Remember, Bill has lived here for about 20 years. So even though he is he's in this concussed fog, uh, he's doing his best to try to figure this whole strange and painful situation to which he, he woke to. He's trying to figure this thing out. Right. So he's doing his best to monitor the situation, even though he is bound and helpless in his own basement. And by now he has lost a lot of blood and he's, he's very weak at this point. Well, and also if anybody's been cuffed with, you know, ties before, I mean, that cuts your wrist really bad. So even though you're trying to create that friction to against the pole to release yourself, you know, it's probably cutting up your wrist pretty bad. Well, at some point he can hear his wife speaking with the men. This means Bill believes them to be in the kitchen as he could not hear them before, and the kitchen is the closest room to Bill. Now, we said that the burglars had not made the big score as they had thought. I mean, you gotta you got to picture this situation. Like the captain said, this is a nice neighborhood. This is an upper-class neighborhood. This is a big home. It's a little bit beyond nice. Yeah, so when you view the home from the outside, these guys are thinking... Oh, there's diamonds and gold and stacks of cash inside. Well, if you look at a lot of the average houses in in Cheshire, Mm -hmm. it's like it almost looks like somebody built a house and then they built another house and then they connected them. That's the normal size of houses there. You know what I find funny here? And well, not funny is not the right word, but um, maybe unique is is the better word. Um, Bill... He's, he's a very successful doctor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's considered like a specialist in diabetes, especially for the area. His wife, a nurse, she may have, have become a stay at home mom at some point. I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, and then we have the kids Sexist. who, we have the kids who are very, uh, smart kids. Um, and th- the thing is though, even though they're, we have two very successful, smart parents, yeah. They seem to me to be pretty modest and reasonable people. Like they don't seem to be, they're not living above their means. They're not, they don't, they don't have a bunch of fancy, uh, possessions. Right. Um, the house is not extravagant. Um, these seem to be very down to earth, uh, successful people. The house is still pretty big though. It is. It is a nice house. It's not like, but like I said, the normal house in Cheshire is like a house connected by, another house and that would be your house and their house is, was definitely modest compared to those. Well, they do have the, the well manicured lawn. They have the, you know, the nice landscaping outside, which I believe, um, Jennifer, Bill and the kids spent time on those things together, uh, as far as the upkeep of their home. Um, now, so we had said that the burglars had not made the big score that they were hoping for. By this point, the men had confiscated Bill's wallet and Haley's wallet as well. Now, Bill's wallet had no cash, zero dollars in it. Right. Uh, Haley's, the she's the oldest daughter, had a hundred and three dollars uh, cash and a bunch of small gift cards to like local stores and shops. Mm-hmm. Um, these she had received as presents for her recent graduation. Um, the two had also found a big bar, a big jar of full of change and they had emptied the jar into a bag so they could take it with them. So a pretty pathetic score for these two house burglars. So we said that Bill could hear his wife, Jennifer speaking with the two men. She is calmly and politely telling the men that th- if they are going to go to the bank, she would need to get her purse for her identification. And she would also need her husband's uh, bills checkbook. Right. So the burglars had ransacked the house finding very little, right? But one thing they did find was a bank book. And according to the bank book, the Pettits had an account with about $30,000 in it. The two men had decided on a plan that at 9 a.m. the bank would open. 
And after the bank is open, one guy is going to drive Mrs. Pettit to the bank where she will withdraw $15,000. And this is at what time? Um, that they've come up with this plan. Right. Um, I do not know what time this is, uh, but it would, would have been after 5.30 a.m. when Bill heard the irrigation click on. Right. So for whatever reason, the two of these guys that have broken into the home and terrorized this family, they come up with this number of $15,000 that they're going to withdraw um, from the Pettit's bank account with Miss Mrs. Pettit uh, in tow when the bank a- opens up at 9 a.m. Meanwhile, yeah, it's weird that you just want to have her withdraw the full amount. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the reasoning behind that. But meanwhile, the other man, the plan is for the other man to stay behind at the Pettit home. So the two bad guys will have the ability to communicate with each other via their cell phones. If Mrs. Pettit tries anything funny, uh, then the man left behind at the home will kill her husband and two children. So now the men and the Pettit family to which they have taken captive, they are just waiting for 9 a.m. to happen. In the meantime, Bill hears his wife leaving a message for Bill's nurse and assistant. This message is just um, Bill's wife, Jennifer, explaining that Bill is not feeling well. Uh, He won't be able to go into work that day. Uh, She will need to call and cancel all of Bill's appointments. Um, Bill hearing this is hoping that this would be a red flag. I don't know that it would be, but his, his reasoning is, you know, he'd had this practice for many, many years and he, he couldn't recall having called off before. Um, if he had ever been sick to the point of canceling appointments, it may have happened once. Uh, so Bill hearing this is hoping this could be a potential red flag that, that somebody on the outside might contact the home or call the home. Anyway, uh, one of the men goes out to Bill Pettit's garage. There he finds some empty washer fluid jugs. Uh, The man then drives Jennifer Pettit. She has a Chrysler Pacifica van. Right. Uh, He drives this van to a nearby gas station. The man fills the two empty washer fluid jugs with gasoline, $10 worth. Uh, he does not put any gas in the van at all. He pays cash for the $10 worth of gas. And then he drives back to the pet at home. Twice throughout the night, Bill heard, um, remember he cannot see anything because they have covered his head, but twice throughout the night, he heard someone come down the steps. Uh, the pettits have a refrigerator in their basement Uh, inside this refrigerator is mainly soda and beer. Well, twice he had heard someone come down the steps, open up the fridge and crack open a can. Now, Bill gets a little hope from hearing this whole plan of going to the bank. Um, you know, this is a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, here's, he considers it to be a bit of a dumb move by these men, you know, because they're going to have to go out into public with Jennifer Um, you know, so Bill is hoping that this is an opportunity that the men could make a mistake. Uh, maybe someone at the bank can become aware that Jennifer is in trouble. Maybe the police get notified and are sent to the home. Um, but at some point he hears, um, what sounds like the man, one of the men returning to the home and a little bit later Now I'm guessing this is sometime near 9 AM because Bill can hear, what sounds to be like his wife and one of the men leaving the home. He's assuming that they're going to the bank, right? And that's exactly what's taking place. So as directed, Jennifer walks into the Bank of America after she's driven there by one of the men in her own van, in her Chrysler Pacifica van. Uh, This is their local branch of uh, Bank of America. She walks in there and she tries to appear calm even though her family has been tied up and terrorized for hours and, you know, basically under the control of these two madmen who had broken into their home in the middle of the night. So Jennifer walks calmly into the bank and just like we all have before, she waited for the next available teller. 
Well, when the teller comes over, ask if she can help her with anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jennifer requested a withdrawal of fifteen thousand dollars. Which, as a teller, you kind of go, "Whoa, that's a big withdrawal." Yeah. And the teller asked Jennifer for identification. Jennifer explained that she did not have any, but she would still need to withdraw the money. The teller then tells Jennifer, I need to see your ID and I will need your husband to be present as well to approve a withdrawal of this amount. That is when Jennifer, as calm as she could, she explained to the teller that there are two men who have broken into my home and Mm -hmm. taken my family hostage. If she does not give them $15,000 right away, they are going to kill her daughters and her husband. Yeah. The teller then turned and went to the branch manager. The teller whispered, um, what she knew to the manager. Uh, the manager approached Jennifer Pettit and asked her for ID. Jennifer held her pocketbook open, showing that she had no identification with her. Uh, She explained to the manager that the two men had taken her ID cards and would not let her have them. Jennifer then showed the manager pictures of her two daughters and then told her how the men would kill them and her husband if she did not bring them this money right away. And then what does the manager do? Well, the, the, the manager is supposed to assess the situation as quickly as possible, you know, to figure out, is this some kind of scam or is this, is this somebody that's in trouble right. that we need to help out here? So you would think that this branch would actually know who the pettits were. Yeah. I, I didn't get that impression that they did, but, um, maybe the, they, but you know, maybe Bill didn't do his banking at the local branch. Maybe he went somewhere closer to work. Who knows? Yeah. And the, the thing here is the manager basically says, having seen the pictures of the two daughters and then the look on Jennifer's face, the look in her eyes, she could tell something was not right for Jennifer that day. And so she very quickly approved the transaction. Uh, the tell the teller started to process this transaction Uh, and eventually would give Jennifer the money. This is cash money. Uh, Meanwhile, the manager called 911. And just as calmly as Jennifer had walked into the bank, uh, she walked out. She then walked out with the money. We'll get right back into this after this quick beer break. Cheers, mates. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. So we have this situation where two men break into the Pettit family home in the middle of the night, probably between 2 and 3 a.m., and we have four people in the home, Bill, his wife, his two daughters. And they devise this plan because they don't find much of value in the home. They devise this plan that they're going to drive Mrs. Pettit to the bank and they're going to have her withdraw $15,000. And if she returns to them with the money, they say they're going to leave. They will leave her and her family uh, after this action takes place. Well, they take her to the bank, and of course the bank surveillance cameras, they capture the transaction, which shows Jennifer Pettit as she informed the teller as to her situation. Uh, as we had said, the bank manager then called 911, reported the details to the police while Jennifer was still with the teller. The manager reported to the 911 dispatcher in real time as Jennifer left the bank and was then picked up by the van driven by one of the men who had broken into her home. The bank manager described the man and described his clothing as he drove away with Jennifer. Well, and described the car as well. But a lot of people, you know, have speculated why didn't Jennifer try to stay in the bank longer? Uh, she was actually in there longer than actually originally planned by the invaders. And yeah. so she she kind of, she tried to give as much information as she could and stay in there a little bit longer. But, you know, you also have, you, you have that fear in the back of your mind that, you know, 
if if I don't make this transaction quickly, he's going to assume something's up, and he he's one call away or one text away from possibly my family being murdered. Yeah, and we played the nine one one call for you at the beginning of this episode. This was Mary Lyons uh, that did the nine one one call. She was the manager there. Uh, she tells the nine one one operator basically we have a lady in our bank that says her husband and children are being held in their house. Uh, the people who are waiting out, there are people that are waiting for her outside of the bank in a car. She's getting $15,000 to bring to them. If the police are told they will kill her children and her husband, uh, they have their faces covered and she meaning Jennifer is petrified. They told her they would not hurt anyone if she gets back there with the money and Jennifer believes them. The Cheshire police responded to this 911 call by sending an unmarked car, several unmarked cars, in fact, to the Pettit's neighborhood. They began calling officers and sending marked cars to the neighborhood as well. The marked cars were to block off traffic in and out of the neighborhood. Once the police started to arrive on scene, they would establish and build a perimeter around the house. This would be after they do a couple of these drive-bys to see if they can gain any knowledge regarding the type of activity that may be going on inside. Right. Um, the how, and of course, uh, the why, and of course, to see if they could learn anything about the two perpetrators. One, they don't know if it's just two. Correct. They're, no. they're told to, but... You Just, don't know right. that. And we we don't know how little, you know, even though Jennifer told the bank teller and the manager what's going on, we don't know how little she knows. Right. You know, there's a situation where it's a big home. She's seen two people. There could be other people in that home. Well, when they first do the uh, drive-by, when the police first do the drive-by in the unmarked car, they see that the Chrysler Pacifica van that was driven to the bank had already returned to the house and it is in the driveway. Mm -hmm. They can see no lights um, or activity in the windows of the home. Right, but their curtains aren't drawn. You, you can see into the house. Yeah, and I actually, um, we have a situation where I believe Jennifer's sister stated that, um, and this is how kind of modest the Pettits were, she said, you know, they had this big, beautiful home and my sister didn't even really own any curtains, um, didn't put curtains in the window. Um, and so they see no lights. They see no activity. As the captain pointed out there, there's not a whole lot obstructing their view. Um, we have the officer in charge. Uh, he has the telephone number for the Pettit house. Right. And he also has cell phone numbers for the members of the Pettit family. But he has to go off of what information he has. You know, what has been reported to them. The men had threatened Mrs. Pettit and her family. But according to Mrs. Pettit, according to Jennifer, they had been nice. Uh, also, they were going to leave. They once, were going to leave right. it once they got their money. Um, but the other information they had is that they would kill the family if the police had found out about the situation. Right. And keep in mind that this is a very small town. Cheshire is pretty small. I mean, the population at this point is well, you know, not well under, but it's definitely under 30,000. Right. So it's a pretty small community. So what kind of technology and what kind of training did this police force have? Yeah. And these type of hostage situations, they're not common. You know, and especially you would you would guess in a town of, of that size that this may be something they've not dealt with before. And so basically, that's what you're working with here. You have the situation where the, they've been nice. The perpetrators have been nice. They're going to leave once they get the money. We know they have the money, but they're going to kill the family if the police finds out what's going on. So that's what you have to try to form a game plan with. And the officer in charge now, he starts sending officers to position themselves. He's sending them to positions in the wooded area behind the Pettit family home. Right. So let's go back into the house for a second here, right? Because by now it's got to be near 10 a.m. This is Bill guessing. Bill is still tied up to the steel support pole in his basement. 
Um, he has been beaten in the head with that baseball bat. His wrists are still bound behind his back well, and around the pole. Yeah, but let's not go with what he thinks. I mean, the call came into the police at 924. Mm-hmm. So um, by the time they head back, uh, this is before 10 o'clock. Right. Um, and he's still tied up with those zip ties and the rope. We should point out that the zip ties are so tight around his wrist that they are actually slicing into his skin. Right, like I said before. His feet are bound with the zip ties as well and the rope. The men who put them there, for some reason, they put this cloth over his head, obviously, so he couldn't see, but they've also thrown some type of quilt over top of him as well. So what he can see are really only shadows throughout the night right, and but, at this point. But they also oddly place down pillows mm-hmm. because it's a hard concrete floor. So again, I think that's some evidence that you know their motive is money and, and not murder. Mm-hmm. Now, they have uh, he's lost a lot of blood, like we said, from his head wounds. Bill has spent hours moving up and down on the pole and twisting his wrist and his hands hoping the friction and the twisting will eventually wear on the zip ties so he can break free. And like the captain said, for some strange reason, they put those cushions under him. Uh, The cushions by this point are now stained red with Bill's blood. And Bill's eyes sting from the blood and the sweat that are running into them. Bill can hear noises from upstairs, but he is unsure of what he is hearing. He hears some kind of some thumping. He says that it sounds like somebody was throwing, you know, like a a 20 pound bag of sand onto the ground, onto the floor above him. Uh, he tries to yell out. Um, and when he does, he, he then hears a voice from the upstairs yell back at him that says, don't worry, this will all be over in a couple of minutes. Well, Bill takes this to mean that the men terrorizing his family will soon shoot all four of them and then leave them dead in their home. Mm -hmm. Bill works hard and faster to try to weaken the restraints around his wrist and arms. Finally, after trying for hours, the zip ties on his wrist, they break and the rope comes loose. Bill reaches down, but he cannot break the plastic ties around his ankles. The Pettit home on Sorghum Mill Drive has two doors that lead to the basement. One, like we said, at the top of the flight of stairs, um, which leads to the kitchen. Right. The other is this, it's a cellar door that leads to the backyard. Up to the cellar door is a a shorter flight of stairs. Bill is going to attempt to make it up these stairs and out the cellar door and over to the neighbor's home hoping that he can notify the neighbor what's going on and call 911 and notify the police. Bill goes over to the stairs and one step at a time, he pulls himself up and then pushes open the cellar door. By this time, it's raining outside. He swings his legs onto the lawn and then through a series of rolling and crawling, he somehow makes his way. This is just a little more than 50 feet away from this door over to his neighbor's home, um, his neighbor Dave. Now, Bill's still lying on the ground. He pounds on Dave's garage door. After several attempts, the door finally opens, and there's Dave. Dave has known Bill for like 18 years by this point. Remember, we said Bill lived in the home for 20 years before this, this incident took place. But, but Dave looks at Bill, and he cannot recognize him. Bill is so badly beaten and covered in blood that Dave shouts at Bill, can I help you? Can I help you, sir? And Bill, louder than Dave, yells back, Dave, it's me. Dave, it's me. It's Bill. It's Bill. Call 911. Call 911. Now, remember, by this time, we have police officers that are stationed and positioned all around the Pettit home and throughout the neighborhood. Right. So I assume some of these officers actually saw Bill coming out of the house. Yeah, yeah. One of them who has been watching the pet at home, um, I'm not sure if it was one from the street or from behind a tree in the backyards of the homes of Sorghum Mill Drive. Um, He approaches the two men, uh, this being Bill and his neighbor Dave. He approaches the two men with his gun drawn, aiming the gun at the bloodied man, Bill, on the ground. 
and the officer the officer orders Bill to stay down. And then a second officer appears out of the rain. One of the officers shouts at Bill, who is in the house? To which Bill replies, the girls. The officer yells again, who is in the house? And Bill yells back, the girls, the girls are in the house. Right. And this, I I think, shows lack of training. Well, very quickly after this, this takes place, a call on the police radio reports that there is a man at the neighbor's home yelling, and it's believed that the man is from the Pettit house. Right. Now, the officer in charge, he's stationed close to and, and with a good view of the Pettit home. He hears this call go out on his radio. He's actually reaching for his radio to request more information. When he sees someone fleeing the Pettit home, running with a bag in his hand toward the van in the driveway. And another call goes out on the police radio announcing that the suspects are on the move. The officer in charge then sees a second man wearing a hat fleeing the home. The younger, thinner suspect gets in the driver's side, and the older, heavier suspect gets in the passenger side of the vehicle. The driver slams the vehicle into reverse, this is the Chrysler Pacifica van right. and the Pacifica goes flying backing out of the Pettit driveway. Yeah. And I would just want to be clear that this is the Pettit's car. Yes. It's Jennifer this. Pettit's van that was yeah. driven to the, to the bank by the perpetrators. Now they're fleeing in her van as well. But we have a couple problems happening here. So mm-hmm. we have the suspects leaving and the Pettit's vehicle. We got to stop them. But uh, cops also heard screams from inside the house, and also the house is now on fire. Yeah, um, and I don't know that they that all of the re- the officers have recognized this by this point. Uh, the officer in charge says that he has not seen the fire. He's kind of focusing on this van at this point, which is right in front of him, and it violently backs out. You know, at a very high rate of speed, backing out of the Pettit driveway and into one of the officer's cars. The police near the police vehicle, they draw their guns and they aim them at the driver and passenger of this van. The driver slams the Pacifica into drive, into drive mode, squeals the tires and rushes from in front of the driveway down the street at a very high rate of speed and takes the corner ahead. The officers can no longer see the Pacifica but they hear a loud crash. The two suspects had crashed the van into a parked, into two parked police cruisers Mm. that had been set up to stop traffic going in and out of the neighborhood. Both of the suspects are forced to the ground. Um, They're being asked by the officers who have guns on them, who they are, uh, what was going on in the house, who is in the house. And then the officers take the two suspects into custody. They make arrests there, and now they can focus on clearing the house. At 10.15 a.m., Bill Pettit's mother, Barbara, calls her husband. This is Bill Sr. She tells him that the alarm company from their son's house has called. The smoke detectors triggered this call. When no one at the home answered the alarm company, they then called the backup number listed. Right. which was Bill's parents. Bill Sr. was already out and about that day. He tried calling members of the family himself, but he got their voicemail greeting. Then, since he was in the neighborhood, he thought he would swing by Bill's medical office. He gets there, and the nurse tells him that Jennifer had left a message that Bill was sick and not coming into work. Bill Sr. then decides to go to the pet at home, because their home is relatively close to Bill's medical office. So he wants to go to the home and check on the house and check on his son. As he gets near the home, an ambulance and several police cars pass him going the opposite direction. He then sees what looks to be Jennifer's Chrysler Pacifica van crashed and smashed on the side of the road. He can't get too close to the house because the police have set up a roadblock. Right. He tells one of the officers 
who he is. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Bill Pettit senior. I'm, I'm Bill's father. Um, and he tells them that the crashed vehicle looks to be his daughter-in-law's vehicle and he needs to be let through. The officer explains that he will have to get someone to come over and speak with him. Well, while Bill senior waits, he's trying to piece this whole thing together. Why was Jennifer's van smashed and was Jennifer okay? And what did that have to do with the smoke alarm going off at the home or his, or his son being sick and missing work? At this point, the Pettit's property, I mean, it's just a, it's a giant crime scene and it's chaotic. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually an officer approached Bill senior and explained to him that there has been a fire at the Pettit's home. He tells him that your son is on his way to the hospital and there are three people deceased in the home. Bill Pettit Sr. calls his family members, first his wife and then his daughter, and tells them the terrible, sad news. He struggles to get the words out. Um, He has to tell them that that his wife's son, Bill Jr., Mm -hmm. and his daughter's brother is is near death and going to the hospital and all of the girls are dead. Bill Pettit Jr. was rushed to the emergency room. Uh, Like we said, he had been beaten very badly, beaten so badly in the face and head that his parents and sister, when they arrived, they didn't recognize him. He has bruises and cuts around his wrist and ankles, and he has lost a lot of blood. He's lost... Seven pints of blood. Yeah, by he's this lucky point. to be alive with losing that much blood, and then also just the the gash. That, you know, there he has some gashes on the back of his head, which you can't really see because of his hair, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it's um, it's the gash on the front of his face. I mean, it's you know, I mean, not to make lightly of it, but when you th- think of somebody dressing up, you know, a Halloween costume or something, you know, putting a big fake gash on their head, that's what it looks like. Yeah. It's it's gruesome and it's big. Yeah, and in pictures uh pictures of Bill shortly after this took place, like you said, you can't really see the damage done to the top or the back of his head. Um but you can see where there's large portions of his hair that is missing. Um you yeah. can tell that from the front pictures of him. And the best way to describe this wound to the front of his head is it it basically runs from his hairline down to one of his eyebrows and it almost looks like somebody put a zipper there. Right. Um, and it's a terrible, terrible wound. Well, and and then like we said, I mean, with these zip ties, you know, he was only bound for, you know, a handful of hours, but the amount of damage and bruising they did to him is, I mean, it's pretty severe. Yeah. And some of that he had to do to himself to try to, to eventually be able to weaken them to the point where he could, escape from his own basement. Yeah. And then his wife's family is going to show up. And uh, I think one of the saddest things reading was, you know, he loved his wife and his wife family shows up to see him in the hospital. And he's basically apologizing that he couldn't do any more to help uh, that. He didn't stop him that Mm -hmm. he left the house and he wishes, you know, like we said, there's two exits, one outside the house to go get help to, go to the neighbor's house, call 911. And the other option would have been to go upstairs and, and try to attack these. Uh, you, and again, you don't even know how many people. I mean, yeah, two guys beat you up, but you don't know that there's only two guys. And and he was apologizing to them and wishing he could have done more. I mean, that would have been a sad, sad situation. Yeah, and her parents, Jennifer's parents, explained to Bill that you do you don't have anything that you need to apologize to anybody for and we are lucky just to have you and you know thinking about that situation of bill being in the basement you have to again it's a similar situation where you you have to think about the cops outside that are trying to build this perimeter you can only go off of what very little information you know. Bill doesn't know what's taking place upstairs in his home. He doesn't know that his home is being surrounded by the police, that they've already been notified. Right. What he does know is this. At one point, there's a gun in his face. 
He has no firearms on him. He has, you know, if they choose to use that gun, he has no ability of defending his family. And secondly, by this point, he's lost seven pints of blood. He's extremely weak by this point. This is a guy that, that also suffered from low br- blood pressure. Um, and we know losing that amount of blood is going to cause that blood pressure to drop and drop and drop and drop to dangerously low numbers. Right. And like I was saying before, it's, he probably went in and out of consciousness mo- multiple times and might not even realized it. Mm-hmm. And by this point, he's he's weak. He's been beaten upon the head. He can't get the ties off around his ankles. I think that, that the thought here, and it has to be the thought here, is that your best bet is to go and get some real help because what kind of real help is Bill going to be able to offer other than that? It, once he got upstairs, if he gets upstairs and he tries to defend his family, it's very easy for them to put one in his head, put a bullet in his head and boom, that, that, that help ended right there. Well, and I think that's the big conundrum when it comes down to hostage situations anyways, you know, do you fight back, you know, and does that cause more harm to yourself and to others or do you let it play out? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the question in every hostage situation. I think that's the question that the police have to face as well. Now, remember, Jennifer's van had been driven by the two men who had broke into the home, crashed into the two police cars that were blocking traffic. And thankfully, the police arrested those men. So now we have two guys in custody. The police arrested Joshua Karmasajewski, and he was the younger, thinner uh, suspect that we said was fleeing from the house. Uh, Joshua was in his late twenties back in 2007, a career criminal in and out of trouble for most of his adult life. They also arrested Stephen Hayes. He was the older, more heavy set one. Stephen Hayes was almost 20 years older than Joshua. Uh, they arrested both those men on that day on Monday, July 23rd. Now the damage that was done, um, as the captain had said, the home was very badly destroyed uh, by this fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a fire that was set in several rooms of the home. We have Bill Pettit Jr. uh, who had survived this incident, and sadly his wife Jennifer and his daughters Haley and Michaela did not. Then the question becomes for the Pettit family, uh, for the law enforcement, for the community, why did this happen and what actually happened and what is going to be the punishment for these two individuals and what could have been done differently to stop this type of situation. All right. We want to thank everybody for listening. We want to thank you for telling your friends about the show. Hopefully everybody has had a wonderful and safe And happy Halloween. We have much more to get to in tomorrow's episode, the how and the why. There's a lot of answers that we need here, Captain. Yeah, and hopefully nobody found any razor blades in their Halloween candy. All right, Captain, happy Halloween to you, to everybody out there. Until next time, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.